And we are back. Hey, I'm Nathaniel Foss, and I'm a professional archaeologist. I have been for over 10 years now. And this channel is devoted to the archaeology of North America, especially the region we call the Eastern Woodlands. Um, today I want to talk about radiocarbon dating because I know that I was taught a whole lot of things in school about it that were just completely wrong. And I've been seeing some misunderstandings of how it works floating around online, so I thought I'd clear some of that up. So the basic principles of radiocarbon dating, it's all rooted in the fact that carbon-based life on, you know, well, anywhere, but uh, carbon-based life is constantly taking on new carbon. So when you eat plants uh, and animals, you incorporate that carbon into your body. And there is kind of a atmospheric average amount of different carbon isotopes. So carbon-14 is different from carbon-13, so on and so forth. So you're constantly kind of keeping that um, that carbon isotope recipe in your body at equ equilibrium over the course of your life until you die. This is true of humans, plants, animals, uh, fungi, so on and so forth. Uh, now, once you die, that stops. You're not taking on any new carbon. And so the uh, carbon-14, which is an unstable isotope of carbon, starts to break down very slowly into nitrogen-14. And this has a half-life of about 5,700 some odd years. So after something has died and after about, you know, almost 6,000 years after it's died, it has half the amount of carbon-14 that it had when it's still alive. This is really convenient because then we can calculate how far uh, down, down the line it's been since that organism died. So this is why we can radiocarbon date anything from bone matter to uh, charcoal, firewood, burned nuts and plants, certain burned residues. Uh, sometimes paints and pigments will have a organic base, so we can do radiocarbon dating on that. Now, that atmospheric equilibrium, that, that uh, amount of C14, ambient in the atmosphere and and in the environment does change slightly over time um partially because of like volcanoes spitting old carbon up into the atmosphere and things like that so it does change slightly but not very much so in order to calibrate that we use uh radiocarbon dating of dendrochronologically dated tree rings a lot of people don't know this that um a tree ring after it's formed it's actually dead. It's not taking on new carbon. So a tree ring from the center of a tree is going to have a different radiocarbon date to a tree ring on the outside of that same tree um, because they, they died at different ages. So what this means is we can take a bunch of tree rings from dates that we know through the dendrochronological record, the tree ring dating, run them through radiocarbon dating, and then start to understand, okay, when a radiocarbon date says, you know, uh, 7,000 years, what it really means is something closer to 6,000 years old. Um, and so we've got a whole uh, calibration curve that is able to calculate when our radiocarbon date comes back with this range, it really means this range in terms of actual calibrated calendar years. And, and that's why you'll see CalBP in a lot of archaeological reports, because they've had to go back and calibrate those old radiocarbon dates. Um, and we can still do this. And our calibration curves are getting more precise and accurate all the time. Now, there's one other thing that's been talked about. It's called the reservoir effect. And basically what's going on here is that you'll have bodies of water, you know, rivers, streams, especially lakes, that have water-soluble bedrock around them, like uh, like limestone. And so that carbon is very, very old. All of the C14 of it has been leached out. And so that water is now full of this um, C14 depleted carbon. And so fish are swimming around in it, incorporating it into their bodies. Uh, various water-based plants are growing in it. And so this is offsetting them by a very little bit, not enough to actually matter in terms of radiocarbon dates. But there's a trophic effect. Underwater, you have these very long food chains where you'll have some plant that gets eaten by some insect, which then gets eaten by a small fish, which gets eaten by a bigger fish. 
so on and so on and so on to the point where that old carbon, every link in the food chain gets amplified. So then if people start eating those big fish that are at the end of like a 12 or 13 link long food chain, and they're eating a lot of these fish, then that can start to offset the radiocarbon dates that we get from the their bones or their, their tissues. But it requires them to be eating a lot of fish. It can also offset like residues. Like I saw one uh, paper where um, they had burned fish-based residues on some pots. They radiocarbon dated that. And those dates were thrown off by a few hundred years. Now, the other thing, though, is that when you have these kinds of trophic effects going on, it just it doesn't just affect the carbon. It also affects the nitrogen. And so you can look at the nitrogen isotopes. And if they're all out of whack, then you can start to estimate how far off those um, those radiocarbon dates actually are. Uh, it only really applies in a very few contexts. It generally doesn't come up a whole lot because we usually, like in the southeast where I work, we generally don't radiocarbon date human remains because those are typically indigenous remains and those get repatriated to the tribes. So I hope that made sense and uh, clarified a few things. If you've got questions, you can leave those down in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching.